and drum roll. Welcome your favorite co-host, the gut personal extraordinaire, the star of the show you've all been meeting for the last 10 days. Here is Katie Hadley. Welcome, Katie, to the show. <laughs> there is so much pressure now. <laughs> <laughs> this won't be a formal interview, let me say that, but we would like to know who you are. We would like to see what it is that you do, how you help, what makes you tick, why you do it. So we're going to dig into all of those things and hear about you. So let me start off by saying, for folks who haven't met you prior to this summit, because obviously some of us have had a longer time to get to know you, myself being one of them, I'm so blessed. Um, can you tell us about functional, um, functional medicine dietitian? Because you've got three titles, functional medicine dietitian, certified health coach, Cert oh my gosh, I'm getting it all wrong. Certified personal <laughs> trainer and health coach. Yeah. That's a lot. I can't even <laughs> see it. It's so much. So can you just... Uh, yeah. The, the titles are just the titles, right? But what is it that I do? Okay, so let's rewind and I'll kind of give a little bit of my story and that'll help kind of give a, a perspective. But like the kind of one sentence of what what is a, what do the titles mean? What do we do? I support folks in their health journeys by... Um, by using lifestyle and natural methods of healing to promote health. Like it, it's, it's <laughs> pretty simple. Like we, my specialty is gut health. So I really, really focus on folks who have chronic GI symptoms and there's a connection, which we'll get into the, the connection between gut health and mental health. So that's really and it's because of my personal experiences that I focus so much on that. And then there's the aspect of longevity, which is just living long and healthy but most people in my experience their gut health is really holding them back so that's mm -hmm. why I focus on it but functional medicine dietitian means we we look at the root cause right everyone's been hearing root cause root cause root cause so this is not like a new concept hopefully if you've been tuning into these these interviews during the summit but taking a root cause approach so often with gut health we really just look at the symptoms and say how can we manage symptoms uh eat you know eat a, a more restrictive diet or just kind of take these supplements to help manage your symptoms there's nothing you can do and we say go on but go about your merry way like there's not a lot we can do anymore whereas I kind of throw that out the window and say no no there's absolutely stuff we can do to start to provide healing so that's what a functional medicine dietitian does nutrition movement sleep toxins all of the things we always talk about those all come into play um, and I don't prescribe, so um, we don't use any kind of pharmaceuticals. It's it's natural healing. Yeah, natural healing. That's that's the one of the big common factors between both of us here. But I want to hear more about your story. You you shed some light on that. You shared some things last time we interviewed um, in the summit last summer, and um, that was really profound. I know a lot of people had incredible feedback to give you for that, and you really impacted them on their journeys to give them that voice of hope and um, the cry in the darkness that they're not alone so is there another another dimension of that you'd like to share to, to how you actually got on the the pathway or do you want to give a like a recap a little bit for people who didn't meet you last time I think a little bit of both so last time we really focused on the mental health piece and today I want to focus more on the gut health piece um, but again, they're, they're so interconnected. So my story as to how I got into all these weird titles and very specific niches that I do starts back when I was a kid. Um, I had chronic stomach aches. <laughs> I've talked to my mom about this recently, you know, because I mean, it started like first grade. It's like, what, it, what was I saying? How did that appear? And she said, I would just always say that my stomach hurt. I just had stomach aches all the time. Um, but I also have a lot of anxiety as a kid, which I don't think is abnormal. And so between the stomach aches and the anxiety, it was kind of just like, okay, she's going to grow out of these things. And the truth is, I, yeah, yeah. But the truth is that I didn't, it actually got worse and worse and worse. Um, and I had had several infections as a child. I was actually hospitalized multiple times for um, a week each time put on long-term antibiotics for 
different really severe infections that I had gotten. Um, and as I got older and older, just meaning like through elementary and middle school and then going into high school, the infections got worse. I always had a sinus infection, just always um, hospitalized for a kidney infection, hospitalized for a staph infection, just all these infections, always had a stomach ache. Um, and in addition to the anxiety, I started developing depression at I think 12 years old is really when things got bad. And, you know, at 12 years old, most people are like, you're a kid. What do you have to be sad about? Right. Like it, most people don't really take that super seriously. Um, but I started self-harming when I was 12. So I was cutting myself. Um, and by the time I was 13 and 14, I was suicidal. Um, I was drinking, I was doing drugs. I was um, I had really bad insomnia, really bad panic attacks. I just did not sleep. Um, and you can imagine kind of what that did to, to my life as a whole. I actually had to, I didn't drop out of high school, but I had to stop going to high school because I could not like physically and mentally like partake. Um, and so I had to go on some kind of a, a home, half homeschooling kind of um, setup. And so, okay, so during all of this, my parents, bless their souls, they, they saw obviously that something was not right. Um, and so they got me help from a therapist who was really, really instrumental um, in me staying alive, to be honest. Um, and I went to a GI specialist a few times and just was told, nothing's wrong, like you're fine, manage your anxiety. Um, and so this went on for years and it's 16, I attempted suicide. And I think it was around that time that um, I had a therapist who introduced me to the idea, that same therapist I mentioned before, introduced me to the idea that nutrition could play a role in mental health. And I had never heard that before. I grew up in a small town. No one had ever said that to me before. No one had mentioned that my gut health and my mental health and the infections, that it was all connected. Like none of this was put together. Um, so I became very interested in this idea that nutrition could play a role in mental health. And so I started kind of just studying it on my own, reading books, and then started learning about the role of exercise in mental health. And so I got into exercise and I wish I could say it was like an overnight like success like oh I was just determined and then I did the things and I was healed and like that's really not how it went at all like in the short version it sounds like this but it was actually you know 10 years of trying to figure out like what was going on and it was it was a compilation of things I had um I did have trauma that had happened and some other trauma that was ongoing that absolutely played a role. But my gut was also absolutely destroyed from all of the antibiotics I had taken and the unhealthy lifestyle that I was living because of the depression and anxiety. And then like it, it went back and forth, right? So I was making unhealthy choices because I was depressed and anxious, but then those choices made it worse. So mm -hmm. it was like this vicious cycle. Anyway, I went on this long journey of just trying to learn anything and everything I could about mental health, because that was what I was so focused on, because I was told, you know, at 13, I was put on, God, I couldn't tell you how many antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds I've tried during like a five-year period or as a teenager, and um, I was told there was just something wrong with my brain, that I had a chemical imbalance, and I was going to have to live like that forever, and so... I just, it, it, it wasn't a good answer for me. And I finally got to the point where I just felt like I wanted to do something about it. So I studied, first I studied psychology. My first several degrees were in psychology. I had like three degrees in psychology or something like that. And then I went on to, after that, I was working in fitness and the fitness world wasn't really where I wanted to be. It wasn't so much focused on health. I was really interested in health and it was really focused on like aesthetics and weight loss. And that was really bad for my mental health. So then I started getting into more of the health coaching of looking at, okay, well, what about the role of sleep and the role of stress? Like all these play a role. So that's how I kind of became a health coach. And then I was really interested in that nutrition piece. So I was studying nutrition, like podcasts, 
I should have so, like so many degrees from podcasts alone. Like, let me tell you when podcasts were developed, like I was like the biomedical neuroscience. I mean, I'm still this way. Like that's what I listened to. Like, yeah. Um, so, so then I went on to get a master's degree in nutrition, health span and longevity. So really looking at the role of nutrition as it relates to quality and length of life. And then I did postgraduate studies in functional medicine, which is looking more at, um, you know, specific disease states and, and, um, the, the biology of natural healing and medicine. So all of this is to say, this is kind of why I have these weird titles and, and backgrounds is because it was really just a journey of trying to understand how I could heal myself. And, the, you know, after so many years of being told that nothing was wrong with my gut, that I was fine, and that I was going to have to live with depression and anxiety my whole life, not only was I able to heal from depression and anxiety, but I was able to completely heal from all of my GI symptoms that had been going on for 15 plus years. Which is phenomenal, right? 15 years of chronic and debilitative. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't even begin to imagine what that was life, like as a lived experience. But to know that in that time, every step of the way, you're trying to seek help. You're trying to, you're speaking to specialists, you're going to doctors, you're being in hospital, you're getting prescribed things, you're being told this fits in your control and you need to do something about it at this point. And then to turn that around yourself, forgive, be, be, be given some breadcrumb ideas, you know, some starting points that go, oh, wow, there's something possible here that I never heard of before. Like a lot of people would have just gone, okay, well, okay, there might be a thing. Perhaps someone else will tell me about that, but you didn't. You said, I'm going to go find out about that. I'm going to take that journey. And you didn't just take a five-minute journey. For, you know, this, was, this is years and years and years of qualifications, studying, investment, practice, clinics. Like, the, you know, I mean, no wonder you're a you know, world-class expert now because you know from both sides, you know, the, in theory, the academia of what has to be, but you also know what it's like to be the patient. And you know the transformational effect of the outcome and you know what is possible, what it feels like along the way. Like it's so incredibly powerful. And I so, know what it's meant to be to be told that you're gonna be like this forever. There's nothing we can do, it's in your head. I mean, the 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 medical gaslighting that happens for women is very well documented, and for GI symptoms is also very well documented. So, you know, we're 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 basically told that you don't know what's going on in your body. And it really, it really creates this disconnect because you're experiencing it. And then someone's telling you there's nothing wrong because we can't find it. Do you know, but when I finally got the gut test that I needed, there were like five different pathologies going on in my gut. I had small intestine bacterial overgrowth, two different types, two types. I had two parasites. I had pathogenic bacteria. I had gut dysbiosis. I had leaky gut. I had unknown food sensitivities that were triggering me because of the leaky gut. I had all of these different things that were wrong after 15 years. When I got those results back, I was like, um, like, can I get an amen over you? <laughs> like, <laughs> crazy. I know I'm not crazy. This has been going on and I've been telling you guys and no one's heard me because, and not because they didn't want to, but because they didn't know, because our conventional practices aren't, aren't looking for these types of imbalances, even though they're so prevalent, so prevalent. I mean, I was, so I was diagnosed with IBS, but more than 70%. So like three out of four cases of IBS are caused by small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So this is just one example of we give it a name and we say done, but it's like giving it a name is maybe the first step. Now we have to say, why is it there? Right. That's such an important point because yes. So often when we're suffering from something, we want to know why we want to know what it is. What is this thing that I've got so that I can now be empowered to do something about it? Because with a name, we can start seeking but if you're being given the name of the tip of the iceberg and it ignores all of the iceberg that's under the sea that's going to cause the problem, then 
that name is useless. Yeah. You, you want to know the name of the underwater bit, the, the big menace, you know, and then when you address the big menace, the top of the iceberg just melts away. So how did, I mean, did, I'm, I'm kind of curious for one second on the story. Did you ever go back to any of those doctors and say, like kind of unroll this scroll of all of those things that they didn't bother to know? Or did you just say, that's in the past now. <laughs> I've got some answers and I'm seeking out new people. It's really interesting that you ask that because it's something that I I honestly think about all the time. So I never have, um, you know, I've seen many doctors, many specialists over the years that missed all of it. And as a provider now, like as a healthcare provider now, I I've thought about that a lot. Like, should I reach out to them and just say like, hey, just so you know, like this is what happened and this is what was actually going on. Like not as like a pointing fingers and like, you know, you stole 15 years of my quality of life, but just as like a, hey, this is a real thing. And I haven't, um, maybe I will. I think some of the struggle for me is, you know, I, I work with patients now with chronic GI symptoms. And by the time folks work with me, they've usually gone down the usual track. So they've talked with their primary, maybe they've seen a gastroenterologist, maybe they've had a colonoscopy or an endoscopy. Maybe they've been told, oh, you have too much stomach acid or, oh, you have IBS and here's a pharmaceutical, but no real discussion of why is this happening? What can you actually do to you know, resolve this, et cetera, et cetera. And they're looking for more, right? And usually because of this, they have other um, symptoms and diagnoses elsewhere in the body. So autoimmunity is huge, right? Because when the gut's out of balance, we can talk more about this, but when the gut's out of balance, it can contribute to autoimmune conditions, mental health conditions. So, so in my practice with the folks I'm working with now, I do communicate with their doctors, um, so that we're all on the same page, right? Because we, we each have a unique specialty and, you know, let's say, for example, if I'm working with someone who, who they've, they've been diagnosed with something and then we've been working on things and they, they want some help with pharmaceuticals, for example, or some tests and they want insurance to cover it. So they want their doctor to order it. Like we need to be a team. We need to be a team. And so I'll chat with them. And unfortunately, often they're not open to it. So that's really my, my hesitation of reaching out because will it do any good? I don't know. I don't know. Some people are not, not all providers are closed off to the idea. But again, if, it, if it's not in the way you've been trained in the way that you've learned and you're within your understanding that that's opening a whole can of worms and in, into, right? What, what we're sharing with people is often a paradigm shift. And if you're a provider working under that paradigm to now have someone else kind of come in and say, hey, you might be doing some things wrong or have you thought about it from this perspective? It, it, it does make sense that people get kind of defensive. So yeah, it's fundamentally a very different system, a very different way of thinking about health and healing and what the body is capable of doing versus what a synthetic compound may be able to suppress. Like, I mean, it's it's chalk and cheese stuff. So um, certainly I've found similar things where you want to speak to them and they're just the, that literally can't hear the words you're saying because it it's a it's such a disconnect between what they understand as reality. Um, and, and that's coming from another provider. I mean, I remember what it was like when I didn't have the education and trying to like verbalize, like, no, you're missing something. So I, I absolutely so empathize when people say like, I've tried to ask for these tests. I've tried to dig in and, and my provider isn't, but I don't know what to ask for. And I've been there too. And so, you know, for, for folks who are listening, if that's you, like I, I, I totally get that. And you're not alone in that. And there are a lot of people who are it's experiencing that same thing. And there is this whole other approach, right, from a functional medicine standpoint, where we look at things differently. What I will say about your question of, have you talked to other providers, um, on the mental health side, folks in the mental health um mental health practitioners seem to be very much more open to this idea now and this understanding that the mind and body are connected. In fact, that, that therapist that I've mentioned so many times, um, we were actually recently in contact and we had a catch up. It was, oh my gosh, it was amazing. But I told her, you know, about what I'm doing and, and the role that my gut health had played. And she was like, oh my gosh, yes. 
Um, and I actually work with a psychological clinic sometimes and, and support some of their folks too and looking at the role of the physical health and gut health and how it impacts mental health. So for some reason in my experience, the mental health and, and um, community of practitioners seems to be kind of further along in this realization of, of these connections and the role, but it, it it's taking longer than we would like in, in my view for conventional medicine to get there. So why is gut health such a prevalent issue then? Because we've been eating since time began, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, if we were all this sick all the way through history, surely there would be a mountain of answers and we wouldn't have had to go through so much suffering and people would have fixed this a long time ago. So what, what's going on now that is ruining it? Well, it's a really interesting like point that you just mentioned, the, the role of nutrition, right? So obviously nutrition, it makes sense, right? What we eat goes directly into our gut, so that would affect gut health. But there's a lot more to it than that. And I get a lot of folks coming to me saying, I don't understand, I'm doing the right thing. I eat a really clean diet. Why is this happening to me? What am I doing wrong? And they almost had this guilt, like I did something. But there's there's a much bigger picture here. And a lot of it is unfortunately outside of our control. But once we know, we can make decisions and, and take steps for healing. So it starts before birth. Like, so when we are born, whether we are C-section or vaginal birth, that alone affects our gut microbiome because the, the, the birth canal seeds our gut. And if you don't get that, your gut microbiome actually more resembles the hands of the surgeon, the hands of the doctor than it does your mother. So, right, if you're 35 years old and you have gut symptoms, there's nothing you can do about the way you were born, right? Whether you were breastfed or, uh, you know, formula fed, that also plays a role. There's nothing you can do about it now, right? I had a ton of antibiotics, wipes out the gut microbiome, right? So there's, there's environmental aspects, there's the, the pharmaceuticals, there's things like having a concussion. Having a concussion causes a leaky brain and leaky brain, because again, these are so innately connected, can cause a leaky gut. So th there are so many aspects to what affects our gut health, how much sleep we get, huge. How much exercise, what type of exercise, the intensity of exercise plays a role. Uh, our stress levels, right? Like that seems kind of intuitive, right? A lot of people get kind of gut symptoms when they're stressed or anxious. Um, so all of these different factors play a role in gut health. And this is why my initial, uh, my initial sessions with, with clients are 90 minutes to two hours. I say it's 90 minutes, but I'm like, can you block off at least two hours? Because like, let's be real, we're going to go there. And before we even start, they have this massive intake where I'm like, okay, set aside another hour or two, really dive into this because now I can dive into it. I can look at it. We can get that out of the way. And then when we meet, we can actually go over it and talk about it. And what we do is essentially create this roadmap, What tends to happen when we in our conventional care, when it comes to gut health, we say, what are your symptoms right now? Maybe we ask a couple like past medical history questions, but we don't go all the way back. We don't go back to, you know, in utero, in birth, in childhood. I mean, we literally, I will map out with folks like on a literal timeline. I take pen to paper and we say, what were your major life events? When did symptoms start? What else happened during this time? What was your exercise like? How about your nutrition? Hmm, seems like symptoms started around this time. What else happened? What preceded that, right? What makes things worse? What makes things better? Like we go really in depth because that helps us understand why you got to where you are, what contributed to it, and that helps us better understand what's going on, what's out of balance, and how can we correct it. I absolutely use testing. We can talk more about testing, um, but that's even the, before testing. That's like, let's get a foundation, like let's get a lay of the land, and then that will even point us to what tests are going to be best for us to better understand what's going on. But in, in this is really essential because if, if we only come at it from the perspective of what are your symptoms right now, we don't really understand what, what led up to this point. Because even if you get a diagnosis, let's say you get a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, an autoimmune condition that affects the, the gut. 
why did that happen? Like no one, no one's asking that. No one's saying, why did that happen? They'll say, oh, it's genetics or you just kind of got unlucky or whatever. But we can actually look at your history and see what's contributed to that. And you can actually help folks get into remission by understanding that and then looking at their current lifestyle and then making changes. So it's really, really powerful to look back in order to move forward. It's essential. Yeah, and it just proves that you're half Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> like, I mean, it, is, that's it is a lot of detective work. I call it a puzzle. Like we're piecing together the pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, because you put it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he's the, he's the most famous, right? So you may as well go, go with the best. But that, that's a huge amount of detective work. Genuinely, it's a ton of detective work. People have got to remember as well. Um, so you you haven't got primary documents necessarily that you can go back to. I mean, you probably have some medical history stuff, but I mean, that that's a that's a lot of investigation, and then you've got to be able to recognise that this is a is an important piece. This is a less important piece, and and map that out. And I love that you actually create a timeline. Yeah, you know, I mean, that must be some really interesting revelations that come out from that. There's, okay, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, let's dig there for a second. What, give me an example, without obviously, you know, quite. Yeah, yeah. So, so people, are, people are very smart in terms of what, what um, when things started changing, what, what they think is contributing, what they know triggers them and what are kind of their safe foods and their trigger foods and what makes things best and works. And if we can tie that in, because... I don't know what it's like to be in their body, right? And, and there's immense value and we have to treat people as a part of their healthcare team. I know this is something you and I have talked about. We've done pocket coaching on this, but I really aim to give people the time and space to share all of that and to try to make sense of it. So it's oftentimes, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Um, okay, so for some people, for example, um, food poisoning, they, they, they maybe had some GI symptoms, nothing terrible, but, you know, belly aches and things over the years, and then they had food poisoning, and they feel like they never recovered. That's a common one I see. Um, Lyme disease is another one. They were okay. They had Lyme. They had to, had to take, you know, two, three months of antibiotics for Lyme, and then they feel like their gut was never the same. Um, there was a really stressful time in their life, right? Um, and, and so this is kind of a, we ask, or we call it the never well since. So mm -hmm. when was the last time you truly, truly felt well? And I don't mean like you were doing okay. I mean, like you were living your best life. And when was, a peri when was the period in time where you've never been well since then? Mm -hmm. And those are two really profound questions that I would encourage anyone, no matter what your symptoms are, or again, if you're not living your best life, no matter what it is, when was that time? Because that will give you a lot of insights. And again, it's typically like, I use the analogy of a cup. It's like, we've been pouring into the cup, right? So maybe you were C-section and then bottle fed, and then you had some antibiotics, and then maybe you had a concussion, and maybe you played really intense sports, and all these things happen, but you didn't have a ton of GI symptoms. And then you went through a really bad breakup, or your parents got divorced, or you had food poisoning or something happened and it all overflowed. And it wasn't necessarily that one thing, that was a trigger, but so much, right? Maybe you had a poor diet, right? So much of that, um, what contributed to that was kind of under the iceberg, so to speak, was, was under the water in the iceberg. So I don't even remember what your question is, but yeah. <laughs> We were digging in because you kind of just went, yeah, there's so much. And so yeah, we just yeah, kind of, yeah saw it. Yeah, so the timeline, so the timeline. So identifying what contrib what was kind of under the surface leading up to it and then what was the triggering event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And I think you've raised the important point for people to to ask themselves those two questions. When when were they living unfettered, you know, completely to the max, everything's tickety-boo, right? And then when was what was the event when that or when did they stop you know that mm -hmm. yeah so okay let's assume now that it, we're speaking to some people who are in a position of having a gut 
issue. And I know that there's a lot of them and they're very complex. And so we're not going to pretend that I'm the expert here, but like when people have symptoms and it, it like chronic we're not just talking about like a small event but like what should they be doing to heal like let's get down to it someone's going to want an answer here yeah right? so yeah all the answers okay <laughs> so in order to answer that I want to go back to what you asked earlier which is why is it so much more prevalent now hmm. so so I, I mentioned several different aspects of lifestyle and the environment that contribute to GI symptoms let's think about 200 years ago, for example, what was it like the, the way we were living? Well, we didn't have processed foods. Mm. Um, we didn't have, pharmaceuticals weren't quite as, as prominent antibiotics, right? Mm -hmm. um, which were especially detrimental to the gut. Um, were people stressed back then? Probably. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> probably. Um, the environment that we live in, the, the, the level of toxins now um, versus, you know, pre-World War were, is, is just profound. And those toxins, you know, we've mentioned glyphosate. This has come up so many times in the different interviews with different experts. Um, glyphosate, but other herbicides, pesticides, toxins, things like that absolutely affect gut health. So there, our environment is changing and our lifestyle is changing. And again, we, we don't want to put blame on people, but simply to empower them to understand the role of these different lifestyle choices um, and choices they can make about their environment to help empower them to create a lifestyle that's more conducive to gut health. So going back to this question that you just asked, which is what can we do? So I think about this in kind of two tiers, if you will. The first tier is general lifestyle principles that have to be in place to support gut health. Mm -hmm. The second tier is what we call the five R approach. Um, and that that's really digging deeper when we, when lifestyle changes alone are not enough. So let me explain lifestyle, the, the tier one, if you will, we have to make sure we're eating a, as least processed diet as possible right? We're eating nutritious foods. We're eating lots of variety. A, um, a varied diet um, leads to a, so a diverse and varied diet leads to a diverse and varied gut microbiome, which is essential for health. We need to make sure we're sleeping enough. We need to make sure we're moving enough, but not too much, right? And endurance sports and high intensity interval training can actually be detrimental for gut health. Um, we need to make sure that our, our toxins in our environment is at a, at a low, low enough level. We need to make sure we're managing our stress. These things alone, huge. I have seen people come back from very, very debilitating GI symptoms from just working on lifestyle. No additional supplements, no additional digging, no tech, like just focusing on lifestyle. This is really powerful. And even if it doesn't solve all of the problems, you will see massive benefits in general to overall wellness. Like, let's just be honest, all of these things are important for wellness <laughs> as a whole, um, but also for gut health. So this is very much a preventative pro approach as well, because if you don't currently have GI symptoms, then we definitely want to make sure that, that we kind of keep that at bay. It is important, though, to say that just because you don't have GI symptoms does not mean your gut is, out, is not out of balance. Let me say this another way. When your gut's out of balance, symptoms can absolutely show up in the gut, right? You can have diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gas, pain, all of the things, heartburn. But even if you don't have those symptoms, we always look in the gut. This is so foundational. You'll hear every functional medicine provider say this, always look in the gut, always start in the gut. Whether you have a skin condition, whether you have autoimmunity, whether you have depression, all of this goes back to gut health even if you don't have GI symptoms. So GI symptoms did play a role for me, but they don't for everyone. We still have to start there because this literally impacts every area of the body. The gut does. I mean, the gut has its own immune system. 70% of the immune systems in the gut, the gut and the brain are directly connected through many different pathways, but one of them is the vagus nerve. People probably heard of that. Um, it, it, I mean, it just, it's so foundational to every aspect of health and wellness and longevity that we have to make sure 
that no matter what symptoms are presenting, that we're looking there. And if we're aiming for optimal health and longevity, we have to make sure we're living a lifestyle that supports gut health. And I'm sure you would say the same for our pets as well. 100%. With all that, because that's huge. And I love that you say that that's <laughs> with the, <laughs> I say just, it's not a small thing. Like, but just lifestyle mm -hmm. can fix the problem. Yeah, we don't need a pill. Yeah, we just yeah. need to change what we're doing so that it's good things in, bad things out, balance starts to happen. But talk about the other tools. You said the testing's a possibility and supplementation's yeah. a possibility. And there's a protocol that you can follow for healing. Yeah. So, okay, so the 5R approach, so this is, think of it as a framework and it's 5R as in like the letter R. Um, we'll talk about what those 5R words are, but the 5R the approach is really now looking at repairing the gut, healing the gut through really specific interventions catered towards your specific imbalances, what's going on in your body. Because imbalances in the gut can show up in many different areas of the gut, right? So we have the stomach, we have the small intestines, the large intestines, we have multiple different accessory organs that support digestion, right? The, the, the purpose of the gut is to digest our food, absorb the nutrients so that we can assimilate them, right? So imagine, right, if, if this goes back to what I was saying earlier, where if the gut's out of balance, it affects everything, right? All of your body, everything needs nutrients down to a cellular level. And if you're not getting all those nutrients because the gut isn't functioning optimally, nothing else is going to function optimally, right? Like it just makes sense when you kind of think of it in that way. So the gut imbalances can occur in many different areas of the gut for many different reasons. So this is where testing comes in. So when we look at that really in-depth health history and lifestyle and all that that we talked about, this typically, and then we look at symptoms, this will help put into perspective um, what may be going on, right? So is there maybe dysbiosis? Is there maybe leaky gut? Is there um, intestinal bacterial overgrowth? So we can kind of get an idea of what's going on based on that. And then we want to test, not guess though. So we want to confirm because we don't want to, two things can kind of go wrong if we don't test. One is we start tackling something that's actually not there. So we don't get a lot of symptom improvement. The other thing is we could start tackling something and actually have, have success and then it's good to go, but there's something else. And we're still focusing on this thing. Like why isn't all the symptoms going away? usually imbalances kind of cluster together. It's not just one thing typically, it's multiple things. So we wanna know what all we're working with so that we don't waste time and money and energy and all of the things so we can be really targeted about it. So this brings us to kind of what are some different testing options. The ones that you'll typically see in like conventional settings, um, are colonoscopies and endoscopies where they're going down or up to look and maybe take samples of, um, and they can do things like diagnose IBD from this, um, but th they're not getting a good picture of the microbiome, the, the, the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses that make up the gut and are really essential to our health. So that's the most common that they will do. And then sometimes we'll do a stool test, but typically the stool tests are pretty limited in what they're looking at. So um, parasites, you can see parasites from a stool test. You can see inflammation um, in, in the GI tract. Um, you can, um, it, it, th those are typically the ones that are most tested for, but you can actually look at a lot more. You can look at yeast. You can look at lots of other inflammation markers. You can actually look at, get a good picture of the microbiome from a stool test. There are also things like breath tests. So it, depending on where you're trying to look in the gut, some of it you can see in stool, some of it you have to see in breath, some of it you have to, you know, do a scope for. So there are a lot of different options. And again, based on everything that we know about the individual, that helps us point to which tests to get. So in my case, 
none of the right tests were being done. So I had, again, things going wrong in, wrong in the small intestine. No one was doing that test. That has to be a breath test. And I had parasites. And the parasite test they did on me was very limited. It was like six of your most common parasites. Well, I had two that they didn't test for. So I was told you're good to go. And so, so this is really key um, that we're doing the right tests and we're doing them properly. This is actually, unfortunately, another thing I see a lot where the tests are done improperly. So that's my long-winded answer to testing. <laughs> <laughs> work with someone who knows like the, the breadth of tests and can make different recommendations and talk with you about what tests you would like to do and explain why they're recommending certain tests and what that would look like. I find that so interesting that the test, even when you test, um, if you're testing or looking for A, but you've got B, B stays invisible. So then and they say there's nothing wrong, but it's like, exactly. there's something wrong. you just didn't find it like because you did the wrong test. <laughs> so with testing, then do you start with a broad spectrum thing that gives you kind of a couple of like, looks at a whole bunch of stuff and then you can refine down? Or do we really need to go through a list and go test for A, then B, then C, then D? Then, like, what's the best way that people should approach? Because you don't want to so, pay this to be useless or, yeah. uh, you know, a redundant somehow. So you want to maximize your testing yeah. options. I wish I could give a blanket statement, but it's really individualized on the person. I will say two of the tests that I use most commonly, a comprehensive stool test. I do a three-day one that looks at the, so stool test, you're looking at the large intestine. So it looks at the microbiome. Um, it looks at um, pathogenic overgrowth. It looks at inflammation. It looks at how well you're digesting your food. You can see like breakdown products of protein, fat, and carbs. So that's the one that I really like super in depth on the parasites and worms, right? No one wants to think about this, but unfortunately they exist. So that's one of the most common things that I start with because it is so comprehensive and it's relatively easy to do. You can do it at home. The second one that I do a lot is the SIBO breath test, just because so many people I'm finding have undiagnosed SIBO um, because these breath tests aren't common, they're done improperly. And it's very well documented in the literature, in the scientific literature, going back decades that, that and you know, our, our understanding is growing a lot more recently, but the, the SIBO is at the root cause of, of many cases of IBS, especially if you've had food poisoning, but you can have it even if you haven't. So um, those are two of the ones that I use most commonly, but there are absolutely other tests that you can do. You can look at things like, you know, yeast overgrowth, um, and, and some of its blood tests, right? So, so there's a lot you can do, but um, depends on who you are, what your symptoms are, what your history is, all of that. Mm. And so once the tests have come back, let's hope that they've been correctly. Okay, let's just take pause with them. Test, because you can get tests yourself. You can buy over the counter tests, right? Is that, and yeah. then tests that you would see a practitioner for. Is that something to be mindful of? Should you start with something at home and then if you get flagged something, see a doctor or? It's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked this because this is a really big problem. The direct-to-consumer tests, so the tests that you can buy as a non-healthcare practitioner are typically shit. Like they just are. Like most of them don't test for um, what really matters. And a lot of them don't give like very in-depth interpretation. And at the end of the day, even if you did have an awesome test that was really great and, and gave you a lot of stuff, like if you're not working with someone who can help you identify what to do next, and I'm sorry, but like a three-page PDF is not what I'm talking about, right? Because some of these tests will do that. Like you really want someone who knows how to look at this and to tie it back to your health and your other symptoms and conditions. Again, because all of this is connected and a lot of this testing, you know, by, by understanding the root causes, it helps us understand what else is going on in the body and why. So I always recommend working with a practitioner, one, because you're going to get better testing, and two, because they're actually going to be able to direct you to the right tests, or do the right tests, and then help you move forward to actually address the findings. I mean, I've had people bring me test results, whether it was blood work or stool tests, and they've literally interpreted it the wrong way. And so they've been doing the opposite of what the findings were because it's just, it, it's, it's Confusing. hard to understand and you're not supposed to have to understand it by yourself. 
So yeah. there's a professional there for a reason. <laughs> you can, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. So, so I will have folks who bring me past tests that they've done. And we, sometimes that's kind of enough to get started. And then sometimes it helps us point to the next direction. What I will also say is if you're doing, if you're doing some tests and the tests aren't showing anything, that's, that's good news in terms of you're still getting answers. If you've done tests and you've done them right, that's okay, great. We can check that off the list. Where do we go from here? That's the problem we run into, right? When I had colonoscopies done at 19 years old, like what 19 year old do you know is getting colonoscopies done? They're like, we're not finding anything done, check, not IBD. And it's like, okay, cool. But what's next? Oh, nothing. Take this pill because it, it'll help with your, 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 the pain. I, Penny, I was double, I got to the point, how old was I? I was in my early twenties. I was doing all the things. I was living like the most healthy lifestyle of anyone I've ever known because I'm trying to heal myself. Every time I ate, and I'm not exaggerating, I would double over in pain. I would curl up in a ball and I would cry. I got to the point where I would eat once a day to sustain myself. And that was all I could manage because the pain was excruciating. Like, I think I have a pretty high pain tolerance now after 15 years of GI pain. And it was, it was so bad. I mean, and think about like the role that food plays, right? Like you got to eat with people and you like food. I love food. It's, it's this thing that brings us together and I right. couldn't even enjoy it. I wasn't getting the nourishment I needed. I couldn't. And it created so much anxiety and fear around food, which I see for most yeah. people who have GI symptoms, because one day I'd eat an apple and I'd be fine. The next day I'd be in the bathroom for an hour. I'd be doubled over in pain from the same apple. Like it didn't make sense. So yeah, I don't, again, I don't remember where I was going with this, but um, the, the, it, it's just, Oh yeah. So we, we can't stop when we find a, a, this is all good. Colonoscopy is clear. Great. Okay. Go to the next thing. Because if you're experiencing those symptoms, you don't have to be doubled over in pain and crying every day after you eat to know that something isn't right. And so if you're being told there's nothing else we can do, excuse my French is bullshit because there is a lot of tests out there and there are a lot of different types of support, even if you can't afford testing. So I work with folks who they're on a tight budget. They've been to a lot of doctors and they've been to a lot of specialists and they don't have a lot to work with. And so we work with that budget and there are simple at home little tips and tricks and tests that you can do to get some understanding. Is it going to be as comprehensive as these in-depth tests? No, but it, it's going to be something. So no matter what your budget is, you can, there's a lot you can try um, and just, just keep digging. Just keep digging. If you're working with someone who's saying there's nothing more we can do, I'm sorry, but find someone else because mm. that, that should never be the case, right? We've talked about this when it comes to pets, right? Like Dr. Mm -hmm. Marlene Siegel was talking about this. Like, even if we can't cure something, for example, she was saying, you can, you can still provide improved quality of life and still provide support and all of those things, right? Maybe we can't, maybe this one autoimmune condition, I mean, autoimmune conditions for some people do reverse, but maybe for this one person, it's not reversing, but it's in permission and they don't have symptoms. Like that's huge. That's imagine if, imagine when you were in that place with food where you one meal a day just to stay alive forcing yourself to eat in order to stay alive because the adverse effects were so dramatic like if someone could have lessened that 50 percent or said every second meal you have will be fine like I know this is not how it works but I'm just saying in principle the concept of improving your quality of life even to the halfway point would have been a game changer you would have Huge. done anything Huge. You would have done anything to have that yeah. and to yeah. be able to go out with friends and have pizza, right? With your, with your friends at school. Like, yeah. it's just mental that, you know, that we're told there's nothing you can do. There is always something. Yeah. And yeah, yeah like you say, if you don't find it, the person who's in front of you right now has answers and they're telling you that the doors are all closed, then literally get up, walk out, find someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Because find, what's that? Find you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I, I just, I've even told people like, 
look at the end of the day, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen in this journey, right? Like whenever I'm supporting someone, like, first of all, that's a super personal commitment that someone is making to like, have me support them in their health journey. That's not something I take lately. Like I know what that's like to, to feel like you're giving someone your health and like, it's in the palm of their hands and you're like, fingers crossed, here we go. Um, you know, again, that's not the approach I take. I, I bring them in to that process. Um, but it, it it's just a very personal health journey. And you, you, you should feel like whoever you're working with, you should feel heard. Mm. And they should be able to say, I don't know if they don't know. And, you know, when, when I'm, when I'm working with someone who we, maybe we find something there that, and, and that's not my specialty, but we found it. I have no problem saying, Hey, this is not my specialty. Let's continue to work on all these things we're working on. And let's bring someone else in to help you, to help support you in this. Right. Like MS is not my specialty, right. I'm not going to try to. So, so when we, when we kind of pretend like we know everything, enough to say everything's fine everything looks good it's all in your head to me that's ignorance mm. because it means that you don't know and that's okay but you need to say that you need to say I don't know let's bring someone else in who can help us find some answers because at the end of the day no one none of us can be educated and be an expert in literally everything and if they're claiming to be <laughs> walk away right so having that, having that kind of humility as a, as a clinician, as a researcher, as a scientist, whatever kind of area of, of health that you're in is, is really key. And if you question your healthcare provider and they get defensive, to me, that's a red flag. Mm. Like yeah. you should be able to ask all the questions. You should be able to bring me a paper and say, Hey, I was reading about this. What are your thoughts on this? Like, awesome. Let's look at it. Maybe I, maybe I missed it. Maybe I already have looked at it and I can provide some clarification on it. Like let's, let's come at this together. Um, because every single person I work with, I'm learning more and more each day because every single person is different in their health journey. You're painting a stark picture here of two different styles. You've got this cooperative care that you're talking about where you check your ego at the door i'll give you everything that i know if i don't know i'll bring someone else in it's cooperative it's you know you're you're giving genuine care and then you've got like ego over here whereas like i am the authority i know what's best for you here's what you need to do i know and you don't yeah. you know <laughs> i know which model i'd rather go for so i want to swing it back around to where i wanted to go a bit earlier um and talk about what can people what do people need to know for a big picture? But um, how, do, how do they go about healing? You talk about there's five R's as a protocol. Can you take some time to dig into what those actually are? Yeah, so the five R's are the framework that we use um, to when we've figured out what's going on, then we use the five R's to provide healing. So the first, so this is not necessarily an order of how you would address them. You have to address them in in kind of order of importance and knowing how they interact. So, but I'm just going to kind of go through them. So remove, we have to remove anything that shouldn't be in there, right? If you have parasites, makes sense. remove them. <laughs> if you have pathogenic bacteria, let's remove it, get it back in check. Also, if you have food triggers that are, for example, triggering your immune system or bothering your gut, let's remove those. What I will say is we can often bring those back in later once the healing has happened, but that's later. So we wanna remove anything that shouldn't be in there, anything that's triggering. Then we want to replace, replace anything that's missing. So oftentimes when the gut is out of balance, our body isn't producing what it needs to be producing for optimal digestion. So for example, um, our body produces enzymes to break down the carbohydrates, the fat, um, to so that we can fully digest and absorb them, right? Because it, let's say you eat rice, your body, the rice doesn't literally go into your bloodstream, right? You have to break it okay. down. <laughs> that would be interesting. You have to break it down using the enzymes. Um, 
Another thing that might be missing is stomach acid. Mm -hmm. So low stomach acid is quite common. It actually has similar symptoms or the same symptoms as um, high stomach acid. So um, like reflux, heartburn can actually be caused by low stomach acid. Um, when you don't have enough stomach acid, not only does it cause those nasty symptoms, but you can't break down your protein amongst other things. So we have to replace what needs to be there that's not. Sometimes this is a, a functional thing. So again, because let's say the gut's out of balance or there's, there's a bacterial overgrowth. So now the enzymes aren't, aren't there or not working properly. So we need to replace those. And then once we heal the gut, your body will actually potentially start making them more on its own. I used to have to take digestive enzymes with every single meal, every single day when I first started this journey. That alone reduced my pain by probably, I don't know, 30%, 50%, maybe even more at certain points. Um, I've had people where digestive enzymes like eliminates the pain by like 90%. It's amazing. I don't have to take digestive enzymes anymore at all. So this, this is very much a journey in supporting the body and its natural ability to heal. However, sometimes it's a structural thing. So if you've had your gallbladder taken out, for example, well, now your, your body isn't producing and releasing the bile that it needs to be when you eat a fatty meal. So now you have fat malabsorption. So maybe that's something that you're going to need to take for the rest of your life because that organ is now missing. And so they're, they're, you know, we can talk about strategies and things to support that, but maybe it's a supplement thing, but, but the role of supplements is very much supportive in that way and, and therapeutic if you're using it for the right reason. So we have remove, we have replace, then we want to repair when, when we talk about repair, we're talking about the gut lining. So the lining of the gut is made up of a single layer of cells. And this essentially divides what, what, what should be in your gut and what should be in the rest of your body, right? I don't so even know how many tiny nanometers that is, but that is ridiculous. It's crazy. So you can imagine how delicate it is. And when, when those cells become damaged, um, they can... So if we think of them like Velcro, right? When you put Velcro together, those little like little like bristles kind of, they like go together. But it, they can become leaky. And when they become leaky, this is what we call leaky gut or intestinal permeability, which is where the gut lining is leaky. And now protein molecules can get through and our body says, oh my God, what is that red flag attack? And now a food that you used to be able to eat, you're having a, a reaction to, we have to repair that gut lining. This contributes to autoimmune conditions as well. It's a whole rabbit hole we won't go down today for the sake of time, but um, we have to repair that gut lining. This is essential for um, gosh, everything, but your, your immune system, your inflammation in the gut, just all of the things. So repair the gut lining. Again, lifestyle strategies and also supplements. For example, L-glutamine, which is actually an amino acid, one of the building blocks of protein, feeds the, the, the lining of the gut, those cells. So if we take L-glutamine on, on an empty stomach and let the, let the cells kind of feed on that, that can help to repair the gut lining. So again, do you have to do it long-term? No, if, if you've created a lifestyle now that supports it not happening again, once we heal it and we address the imbalances, hopefully then we can kind of taper that out and, and take that off. So we have remove, replace, repair. The fourth R is re-inoculate. We hear a lot about probiotics. <laughs> I've had people who, um, that's what they were told for their guts and just take a probiotic like oh yeah bacterial overgrowth take a probiotic wait they have bacterial overgrowth how's going to add in more bacteria going to help with it and then, and then it makes their symptoms worse like i'm laughing because it's absurd like it's just absurd so yes re-inoculate is one aspect of this but if you have for example overgrowth we can't re-inoculate until we've removed the overgrowth and then we can re-inoculate so that comes down back to addressing this in a, a systematic approach based on what's going on in your body. Okay. So re-inoculate refers to putting back in this bacteria to have a healthy community. We can re-inoculate through supplements or, and, or through foods. Mm -hmm. And then the last R is rebalancing. And this refers again to the lifestyle piece. 
at the end of all this, if we still eat uh, an inflammatory diet and we still don't exercise and we still have poor sleep and we still have stress and all of these things, it's going to happen again, right? Mm. So we have to really rebalance the lifestyle because one thing I always tell people is once these symptoms are gone, like we want them gone for good. I don't want you ever experiencing what you're experiencing now because that's pretty miserable. And there's a lot we can do from a preventative approach once we've gotten things back into balance. I was just going to say the, the prevention side is then yes. so key because of course, functional medicine is, is looking for the root cause and also aiming to protect against, like we, we don't want to get the disease and then have to deal with it, which is reactive medicine, right? We want to be looking at how can we optimize the body so that it, if any, any threat or any, you know, um, unbalancing event that comes to it, the, the body doesn't fall down a hole and get sick. Yeah you know, you, yeah. you, you can stay in that place. So does the gut become fragile or weakened from having been damaged so that protection becomes even more important? Or once it heals, does it go back to, I'm all good, I just need the same level of protection as any other part? It really depends on the person. Um, generally, I find that folks who have been in that place where they're gut is really out of balance and they've been experiencing that that they are more prone to kind of sliding back because their their gut is for for one reason or another their gut is just um more sensitive it's more sensitive um and that would make sense i mean if i'm thinking about like you know bones aren't my specialty but if i'm thinking of like a broken bone it would make sense to me that after you've broken that area it could right you you would want to be a little bit more careful with it I don't know if that's true or not but that's like what's going to actually get stronger after oh break. my gosh Penny you ruined my analogy <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> I could tell the way you're looking at me like, like no nope, you're clearly not a bone specialist all right so I'll stay in my lane so for the gut <laughs> it's typically people are more sensitive um but it, it as time goes on the gut continues to heal. It's not like a one and done. It's not like, okay, at the end of six months, you have a brand new gut and like you can do all the things, right? It, it's it's very much a journey. People typically see, see symptom reduction or symptom relief happen really quickly. So if we have a really clear picture of what's going on, I mean, within a matter of weeks, mm -hmm. people are feeling a lot better. Um, and we want that to be a reflection of what's going on under the surface, right? It's not just um, it's not just surface level in terms of symptom reduction, but because we're 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 addressing what's going on under the surface. So mm. um, over time, the gut continues to improve. Sometimes these these imbalances leave damage. So I've been talking about SIBO a lot, so we'll just keep referring to SIBO. So when you have bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, it actually causes leaky gut. So even when you get rid of the SIBO, now we need to work to repair the gut lining. And maybe you got SIBO because your motility is slow. So we need to speed up the motility. And as we kind of do more and more this step-by-step this -step approach, we have to do one and then we have to do the other, right? It needs to go in order. Then you will continue to see symptom relief as this happens. So in my personal journey, I know um, very quickly if I'm doing something that's not ideal for my gut because I go from zero symptoms to feeling a little bit achy or my tongue starts getting worse. So your mouth is a really good indicator of what's going on in the gut. And my tongue is like one of the first indicators if, if something's going on, you, um, like scalloped edges, uh, fissure in the middle, swollen tongue, things like this are all symptoms of gut imbalances. Um, so so now that I know what was wrong, what I'm prone to and so forth, and then I'm like, okay, this symptom is coming back. What is this one typically related to? Now I can address it immediately versus not knowing, not knowing what triggered it, not knowing how to heal it. And then it gets out of control again. So going through the journey in and of itself. And again, it goes back to bringing people in and looping them in and having them understand and be aware of and be a part of this journey because it now empowers you because I'm not going to be in your back pocket all the time. I mean, I will be if you want me to, right? Like, 
you know, I have clients texting me, you know, they have like a private messaging portal, but they send me messages all hours of the day and night and weekends and whatever. Um, but ideally we get to the point where you don't even have to, because now, you know, and we've tried a lot of things and you know, what works for your body. And you can say, now, now I have all these tools in my toolkit. I know I can do X, Y, and Z with my lifestyle. I know I have X, Y, and Z supplements on hand that can help provide support in the meantime. Yeah, it's the proverbial thing. You know, if the hungry man needs food, you can give him a fish or you can teach him how to fish, right? So you're you're a fishing teacher. <laughs> you, I try. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes yeah. is a fishing teacher. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I very much, I love the teaching aspect. I love like seeing when it clicks for people, when they've been dealing with something and it's like, oh yeah, it's X, it's X, Y, and Z. Like, does this align with what you experienced? And they're like, um, yes. And no one's been able to put that into words. And that's, that's just such a game changer. It's so empowering. It brings so much hope and it makes you feel like you're not a crazy person after feeling like a crazy mm. person for a long time. Yeah. No to be validated and, and heard is, is so key. So, okay. There's a bunch of people now I can guarantee who are saying, right, that's me. I want to be seen. I want to be heard and validated. I want a fishing teacher in Sherlock Holmes. How do they find you? <laughs> Okay, so um, before we go into that, what I do want to say from a supplement standpoint, so. Oh yeah, let's dig there for a second. So supplement, because I get asked about this all the time and you and I get asked about this all the time. And these five R's are applicable for both you and your pet. Like, let's just, let's mention that because if, if you haven't realized all the overlap, this is absolutely one of them. Um, and I know you've mentioned that, that dogs can get similar pathologies to what humans get in the gut. So these, these five R's, um, supplements in my practice, I use again, supplements therapeutically. What I do not recommend is to simply blindly go onto Amazon and order probiotics and order random things that you've heard about, because again, we know really that, that can make it worse, right? You just said it that. can absolutely make it worse. Yeah, it can, it can. Um, and unfortunately we also have this issue of quality of supplements where we have these supplements that are available to consumers, right? The, the non-healthcare practitioner and the, the quality just is not up to par. You can have things in there that shouldn't be in there. You should have things in there that should be that aren't. You can have them contaminated. You can have them in the wrong doses. Like this is a really, really big problem. So we have these medical grade supplements that you can get through healthcare practitioners. But if you buy them directly, we often don't have guidance on how we should be using them, what they're used for, and so forth. So there's we're we're coming down the pipeline with a couple things. Um, but in the meantime, well, I'll just explain that first. So Penny, you and I are going to be um, giving pet and parent longevity community access to um, my medical grade supplement dispensary where folks can go online. This will be available in many different countries. You can go online and you can order good quality supplements um, directly to you at a discounted price. Um, and we'll actually have some guidance on there in terms of like favorite supplements for X, Y, and Z. Again, these are kind of general recommendations versus the one-on-one the -on -one individualized approach, but that's not out yet. We're hoping to launch that next month. So stay tuned, this will be available to you in March, 2023. In the meantime, though, there's a supplement company that I really, really like and trust and recommend. They're called Gut Personal, G-U-T, Gut Personal, I love the name. And Gut Personal was actually developed by a fellow functional medicine dietitian, Bridget, she's fabulous. But what I really love about their supplements, they... So the quality is there. They really focus on education and I'll put, we'll put a link to this, but you can actually take their quiz on like your different symptoms and history, and then it will help point you in the direction of what supplements might be most helpful for you. And the supplements are, it's not like a huge concoction in, in one, because that can be, if you're sensitive to one of the things that can all go downhill. So they use like one or two really simple blends, really powerful ingredients. So like I mentioned before, L-glutamine, they have, um, I think it's called the soother is L-glutamine. And again, this helps feed the gut lining. They have a really great probiotic, a prebiotic, which feeds it. If you have constipation, they have a magnesium one that called the mover, right? It helps move things along. So you can go online, you can take their quiz and they're actually offering the pet and parent longevity community 10% off everything. Um, so the code is pet and parents spelled out. We'll share that here. We'll give you the link. Um, and 
they're also offering all VIPs $100 um, gift certificate raffle. So if you're a VIP, you can enter the raffle to win a hundred dollar gift card to their shop. So really incredible, amazing resource, highly recommend to check them out. Um, and then stay tuned for more info as we start, you know, sharing more about our dispensary as well. So again, just something, you, yeah, just to clarify something because I, I'm not sure if everyone's going to know how unregulated the supplement industry yeah. is. And this is why there's a difference between medical grade supplements and your standard just grocery store shelf. Like what, is there even a name for these other ones? Um, just point out. The what thing, the yes. So the thing is that the supplement industry is not regulated. So like the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration here in the States, it's, it's making sure that your food, like everything that's in your food is on the label, right? If you have an allergy, that's really important to know. They're going to put it on the label. All the ingredients legally have to be on the label of a food product. Supplements are not considered food products, and they're also not considered drugs. So the FDA doesn't regulate it in the same way. So the, this is a whole other category that's unregulated. So you do have third-party like investigators almost and um uh, organizations that will third party certify supplements and say, okay, we've tested these, these don't have, um, you know, any heavy metals and they don't have anything in it that they say they won't, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Like if you're an Olympic athlete, you got to be taking these supplements that, that are certified because you could be banned. Right? Otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. If you take something, this has happened where people have taken something and it was laced and they didn't know. So the medical grade supplements, um, are they, they, these companies have much higher standards internally, and they will also often have third-party people certify them as well. So these are, it used to be that you could only get these supplements from healthcare providers. Now, some of them you can get, um, like online, but again, most people don't know which, which company should I use or shouldn't I use, which ones are medical grade, which ones aren't. And then again, you go onto their website and there's a directory of 200 supplements and you're like, uh, <laughs> okay, I guess I'll just close my eyes and pick one. Like, but that's not therapeutic. So we have to make sure we know why we're doing it. And we're using an evidence-based approach to how often, how much, all of the above. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you for digging into that because I know when I first started looking at supplements, I literally fell head first down the hole and, and it was like oh my gosh this is so confusing I don't you know some of the compounds are synthetic some of them are natural some of them are chiral some of them are not some of them are bioavailability blockers for each other how like you need to be PhD in chemical but you know yeah. and I was just like that's too hard I need to find someone who who I can trust on that who has actually made you know has tested has chosen top quality ingredients knows that they're not going to interact with each other but will be able to actually multiply their effect have a synergistic thing going on so that you're getting a lot of value from that bottle and yes that bottle might cost you more but you're actually getting all the promises that that are involved with that and usually at a you know multiplication effect so it's it's a complicated science um and if you don't know that then you really are just like i used to be just throwing money down the drain because you know if you're putting it in and it's going straight out the other side because your body can't work with it it's, it's wasted or it's not what the body needs or worse it's mm -hmm. gonna make it worse yeah 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 exactly so so supplements again um d depending on it, again, it's all dependent on the person. What do you want to do? What kind of methods do you want to do? Do you only want to do lifestyle? Are you open to bringing in supplements therapeutically? Are you someone who prefers to use pharmaceuticals? Are you someone who prefers to only do, right? So like you have to know, and you, you know, hopefully whoever you're working with will ask you these kinds of questions and present you with options because the truth is you have options. You absolutely have options. No matter what it is that you're dealing with, there are multiple routes you can go and having someone who can explain those to you and empower you with, with the knowledge and the decision. If you, you know, they can give their opinion, of course, but at the end of the day, you have agency over your own body. And when you're equipped with the knowledge to make the decision, 
then I mean that that's a win-win scenario exactly yeah well thank so. you for explaining that yeah and then, where can people find you because yeah. <laughs> yeah. they're okay, going to want to find yeah. the supplements now and they're going to want to find you so that they can take the right ones know how to use it get to the bottom of the mystery do those five hours and come out the other side fully healed and optimized yes okay so so there's similar to to how how you work penny i have kind of two routes the one is working with me one-on-one -on -one. the other is joining our group coaching program you can also do both so in our group coaching program we go over all of the lifestyle pillars and we actually spend a whole month talking about gut health um and and so it's really foundational in terms of creating this longevity lifestyle that supports your gut health your mental health your lifespan like literally all of the things if you're wanting to dive more into depth you know doing looking at your timeline doing your health history and testing and coming up with a very specific plan and then each step we take right looking at that plan what's working what's not where do we go next step by step working with me one on one is going to be the best way to do that because we just don't really have the capacity to do that in a group setting so um i will share um a link to a 15 minute discovery call so if you're interested in learning more about working with me one on one what that would look like you can share you know kind of what your health journey is where you're at and i can share kind of my perspective we can see if it's a good fit um it's a complimentary so there's no charge we'll share that link um for that and we can also discuss if you're like do i do coaching do i do one-on-one -on -one? we can we can chat about that and, and those differences as well so those are the the two ways that you can work with me amazing and where do people find you where do people find me um usually standing in front of my computer <laughs> doing this <laughs> during a so, summer right yeah, here, exactly, right here. exactly exactly so um pet and parent longevity obviously um you know you're my better half here but i am here um and then i also have a private practice called holistic health and wellness um my website is just my name katiehadley.com um, remember my first name is spelled different k-a-y-t-e-e -E, but katiehadley.com um, and that's where you can learn more about my private practice working with me one-on-one -on -one, um all of those things and i think that's it and then on socials same thing katie hadley pet and parent longevity i get you know i'm around right we're not hard to find <laughs> yeah, i don't think so in the facebook group in the email i mean all of the things up but yeah we we'll yeah yeah, I know, right? So um, yes, we'll share those links for my website, one-on-one, -on -one, for gut personal um, with the code pet and parent. And then remember to join the raffle. Oh, so to join the raffle, you just take their quiz. So we'll share the link to their quiz. You'll get your individualized results with recommendations on which supplements they recommend. And then you'll, if you're VIP, you're automatically entered to win the $100 gift card. Amazing. So, yeah. Is there anything... I mean, we've had a really diverse session here, a conversation in lots of different directions. Is there something that I haven't given you space to dig into or touch on that you really want folks to know as we're wrapping up, something to take home or just re-inspire them? Just that message of hope. I, I, I wish I had had that so many years ago. And just encouragement that if you feel like you're not in your best health and you're not living that best life then you're not like there is a lot of room for improvement and and the biggest thing for me was I mean if you you want to go down the route of getting like a bunch of different degrees and certifications and spending decades doing that by all means yes do it <laughs> but um the 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 big change for me was having the right people to help support me while I was learning about that because again, that's just a much longer process. And if you can have someone kind of expedite that for you, run the right test, support you in the right way, help you understand what to do next, that is such a game changer. And at the end of the day, like you deserve it. You do. You just, I know we talk a lot about pets during all of this, but I hope that my voice is just always in your head, like, and you too, <laughs> remember your health <laughs> as much as your pets deserve it. So do you. So <laughs> you're, you're, you can find healing. Uh, is it easy? No, it's not always easy, but it can be pretty simple. 
if you have the right support system in place and and it will help get rid of that overwhelm and the feeling of being stuck and the feeling of not being heard and all of that like not only does it affect your physical health right because you're not getting the support that you need but it, it really takes a toll mentally spiritually emotionally just all of those things so when you can have the right support system and just continue to support your body in that way the effects are really profound I never I honestly did not think that I would be living the life that I'm living today because for so long I was told there's nothing you can do and I'm so glad that I kind of gave the middle finger to that and said uh that's not good enough Mm -hmm. because healing really was possible and yeah I'm just, I'm, I'm blessed to live a life that I never thought I'd be able to live because of that. So if that's you, I hear you, I'm with you and you're not alone in that. Yeah. And you're really paying it forward as well that you, the path you trod, we'd wish on nobody, right? That does, nobody deserves that level of suffering. And, but you've turned what was a terrible experience into something meaningful that you can bless other people with that you've really invested the time in your life to study this stuff to understand it not just for you but to pay it forward to give it out to share it um and the message that the twofold message because that I heard in what you were just saying then is you are worth it like doesn't matter if your doctors are not treating you with your other people around you or whatever you genuinely are worth it like you matter your happiness your health in your life matter and if anyone tells you otherwise it's a lie and the second thing that there's hope that it doesn't this is not a life sentence this may be the current state of affairs but there are people out there who have the answers there are people out there who love you and support you and even if you haven't met them yet they're already cheering for you so I love that beautifully said (laughs) I'm just summarizing you (laughs) Well, thank you for giving me the time and space to talk about this. I mean, you know, I could talk about gut health like forever. (laughs) I I try not to go on rants about like, you know, the medical system and and all of the things, but I have a lot to say about this. So I, I appreciate everyone listening and our community for giving me the time and space to share. And I hope that folks listening will use me as a resource because like you said, like, what's the point of suffering if like we can't use it to help lessen other people's suffering like suffering exists it does but there's a lot we can do about it and I try to make mine worth it by helping other people not go through it avoid it yeah yeah thanks for chatting with us thanks Penny